Hello, welcome to the Theology Podcast. It's great to have you uh, here for this episode. I'm C.R. Wiley. I'm a pastor. I serve a church in the Pacific Northwest. I've written a number of books, and I'm working on a book on totalitarianism right now. And it's really got me feeling uh, like, uh, well, like I'm in a totalitarian regime. You know, just the demands that are that are I'm, I'm kind of uh, experiencing with regard to trying to make sure I get it right. Uh, are really kind of oppressive and I'm being (laughs) tortured. I'm in the torture chamber. Anyway, that's enough about me. Uh, How about you, Glenn? I'm Glenn Sunshine, retired history professor, senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, ministry associate at Reflections Ministries, few other things as well. And I'm also working on a few books. Okay, Tom. Tom, tell us about yourself and then just take us right into the subject of the day because it's your day. Okay, I'm Tom Price. I teach systematic theology, Christian ethics, philosophy, a few other things, and I'm working on a few things. Um, Several books have come out of the idea of one book, and one of the books um, we'll be dealing with an issue that we're going to be dealing with today because it is a part of Christian ethics and uh, ethics as a whole, but I think it's not so pertinent to our Christian life and what we're confronting culturally over and over again. And so if I were to throw out kind of a, a topic idea, it would be deformations of the Christian notion of liberty of conscience. So deformations, right, bad forms of um, what was considered principally a good throughout most of Christian history and culture, even though it has a variety of forms, that's liberty of conscience. Um, And so I'll let the other guys in a few minutes kind of spell out what you know they're under help fill in the gap of what we mean by that term liberty of conscience but i'm going to give a few uh episodes uh in my own life of confronting kind of these deformations um when i was a young christian and i grew up in the baptist world it was a very celebrated doctrine uh liberty of conscience this was one of their contributions i think to american culture um, in some form, um, the notion of not being forced to believe something against your will, right? Um, that your, your conscience, um, you owe it to your conscience as a gift of God to conform to the truth in the way that that truth compels you to. Um, and so neither Pope nor state nor anything else has a right according to this view, to trump that relationship. And so you see some of the, you know, American forms of that take shape with with political policy, especially in terms of things like uh, a kind of general cultural pluralism in terms of religion that allows people to pursue religion and truth um, without kind of being forced by the state or by the church to believe only one way of things. Now, there are, you know, that, that may be a, a bad summary of, of that teaching, but it highlights some of the uh, features of it, as it's at least understood by many, many today. Well, in the Baptist world, it wasn't so, so broad. I mean, it, I think it was trying to basically say, let us be Baptists because we read the Bible in a way that confirms the Baptist form of Christian life. And we don't want to be forced by, you know, pope or, you know, uh, archbishop or state to go against our God-given conscience, you know, our ability to discern truth and our capacity to to follow it and make judgments about it. Um, And so, but what happened in the Baptist world, and it started to happen in the whole Christian world, um, is that there was shifts in the understanding of reality, metaphysics, truth, God, human beings, human nature, everything else, everything really. But so more more or less the background within which the, the, the conscience is, is, is exercising its convictions has changed, has changed. That's right. And so the understanding of the human being and the human conscience has changed. And we would know this today as kind of in, in its fullest form as kind of the enlightenment. Um, but, but one of the things that happened in the Southern Baptist world that I grew up in is there was a culture, I mean, well, a civil war, if you will, uh, or, and it was kind of escalating between what was then known as kind of 
moderate or liberal leaning or progressives, uh, these terms can mean many things, um, Baptists versus kind of the ones that held to kind of a continuity, at least in terms of confession and, and moral practice with classic Baptist forms of Christian life. Um, and so you had a tension arise between those who, for example, held to an inerrant Bible as an authority that all Baptists were supposed to conform their beliefs and moral practices to. Um, and so that was built into that Baptist vision, and it wasn't in conflict with their notion of liberty of conscience. They understood conscience as basically just the way in which we are supposed to, as human beings, receive that truth and act faithfully in accord with it. Um, but what happened is the notion of Scripture started to change in the seminaries and as modernity started to impact the universities. And so as ministers were introduced the new ideas of the Bible in which you still had an authoritative Bible, but it was no longer on the kind of content of the Bible read the way the church has read it classically. It, that world could no longer be believed. Um, so we have to make sense of the authority of the Bible in a new way. And one of those ways is the Bible was kind of introduced kind of some new truths that are divine revelation, um, but they're, they're binding on us only in ways that actually um, bring us along to convince us that they're true for us. So these aren't, true, these aren't truths about the reality of the, 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 the uh, world the things that we claimed. live in. Yeah, this That's is right. just, just the stuff that is more private. More, yeah, our own, our own moral spiritual journey, if you will, right. will, will receive things reading the biblical text that can con confirm or affirm things that are true for us and uh, true for or be you. rejected. I mean, this is where it ends up. <laughs> so, you know, in other words, we got a, we got Baptists who are saying it's true for you. You know, yeah, well, that's right. It's my my <laughs> truth. And and again, they uh, early on they wouldn't say it like that. They would tend sure, to think sure. that early on they would basically try to say that the 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 metaphysical and moral claims of the Bible um, do have have been impacted by the new thing Christianity gave, maybe the universal love for your neighbor, or they, it's very reductionistic, whatever it is. Um, but they're not binding. They're culturally, they're culturally formed, and therefore they include all the biases of the past. But what we need to do is mine through that, pull off that kind of mythological shell that they're, they're steeped in, or that patriarchal shell or whatever, and pull out that kind of kernel that is consistent across time. So this way, they're faithful to Scripture in terms of that kernel, whatever it is, um, but that kernel tends to be something that, it, in their mind, can't be locked in or located in any generations. So you could say that they're at least too Except their sharp. own. Yes, right. <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's yeah. right. I, th the, I think the, that's, I think, yeah, I think that's key, Glenn. So you, you, yeah. you've got two shells, so, so then you've got kind yeah. of the mythological shell and then the ethical yeah. shell. Yeah, So yeah. those are the two things that we have to get through to get to the, to the, to the core. Core. And but yet, then, but what Glenn's yeah. brought out is, is you're, yeah. you're deconstructing everything except yourself when you do that. Yeah. And this group of people early on tend to be still essentialist enough. And what do I mean by that? They still thought there was some essence to Christianity. These were not pure functionalists, that it kind of it's a it's an extension or a function of something that I can put into use. So they would still think there was an essence there, but that essence was so reduced and oftentimes so detached from the particulars of Christianity that Christianity in the historic form was again just a mythological shell, and we need to for Boltmann, like re-mythologize it, if you will, according to our, our present understanding of reality and truth. So that's one way of looking at it. I mean, other, other groups were Kantian in the sense that basically Christianity was all about developing the individual moral agent or group collective agencies to be able to determine for themselves um, with the dignity of their own uh, gift of, 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 you know, moral orientation, um, to, to decide for themselves what, what authority they're going to subscribe to or not. So 
in either case, you basically have a redefinition of the human being um, and a redefinition of doctrine and what it means to su you know submit to scripture. And so, in a way, it's basically scripture becoming the authority of scripture is basically something that is a servant of the the real authority, which is the individual or the group's um, conscience. Um, and now would they would know. they go that far, Tom, and put it that way, or would they? Is that just a kind of a your take on what was really happening? But yeah, they wouldn't they wouldn't put it that way. Now, now, if you would go to like, let's go to Germany, you know, during Karl Barth's uh, liberal phase, um, he studied under a figure named Wilhelm Hermann. And Wilhelm Hermann, who was kind of the out, I mean, he was the, the fashionable theologian of his time. On the one side, he was completely modern in the sense that on this kind of material um, embodied level, um, we're basically stuck in a machine and Christianity um, has in its historical dimension and it, in its description of reality is nothing more than a time bound, um, mechanically caused way of looking at things. But in Christ, some principle is introduced that is the pr principle that allows us in some sense through our religious experience of him, however it comes through the medium, the medium doesn't matter or what it says, um, and that experience of him allows us to transcend and have a, a direct union with God. And in having that direct union with God, um, we basically become Kantian man and become the ground for, you know, what parts of the Bible impacted us and are authoritative, and then how to shape that moral life in light of that impact. So, it's not a far stretch to think that, that that kind of those ways of viewing things were were really going on. They were trying to still hold to union with God, transcendence, and things like that. But it was all about the human individual and their moral their moral conscience as sort of the ground of but, their but their they, being. What they what they lost faith in was creation as such as creation, and lost faith in the providential ordering of history. Yeah. So those two things have been lost, and yeah. so they're trying to preserve a kind of authentic experience yeah. of God without those things. That's, so yeah. that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Now, when when you raised the topic of liberty of conscience, um, my mind went back to the early church. Yeah. There's a shock. I'm a historian. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> So what you find as early as Tertullian, the the question of liberty of conscience is different than. Although I think that it's got resonance today now. It's a question of what are you allowed to believe? Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, that, that's got serious political implications in the Roman Empire. But as early as Tertullian, second century, Christians began arguing that um, they don't talk in terms of conscience. They talk about um, worship. Yeah. And what they say is, look, God is not pleased by worship that is compelled. Yeah. The only worship God will accept is worship that is voluntarily given. That's the only yeah. one that pleases God. Therefore, you have to allow for religious liberty. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and that, that occurs, interestingly enough, uh, we hear that, and we hear that as an individualistic thing. Yeah. But I suspect for the early church, it wasn't solely individual. It was yeah, also right. corporate. Because they had a much stronger sense that when you become a believer, you become a third kind of human being. You're not a Jew. You're not a Gentile. You are something different from yeah, both that's of them. Right. So you yeah. join this new people. And, and so th they see a corporate dimension there that I think we don't recognize. Yeah. But again, the fundamental argument is, yeah. um, is one that the church held pretty uniformly until Augustine who yeah. argued you shouldn't compel pagans, but you can compel heretics to come back to the faith. And yeah, that, yeah. that's where a whole host of problems start. But that, that's a, probably a yeah, different Well, well in, interesting you, you, you mentioned that because I, I think it's, it's important also to, to know that, that this is very much tied to why the early patristics did focus on the issue of freedom and free will. They were not Pelagians the way we, we talk about those things. What they're trying to do is compare 
the glorious freedom of the children of God compared to the ontological and metaphysical systems of pagan religion, which were locked into fate, that were locked into basically having to conform to, well, static wouldn't be, you know, the best way of putting it, but hierarchies and, you know, static forms of things oriented, you know, in, in a, you know, a, a ordered cosmos that were pretty much locking us in place, right? We wonder why St. Paul didn't just say, okay, slavery's wrong and overturn it. Well, because you're dealing with a world that was stuck in, locked in <laughs> to a, an immovable system predominantly um, in, me, in many cases, or if it was moved, it, it's moved by a certain kind of spiritual process. Christianity's... Well, yeah, we can add that. I think another major reason why Paul doesn't go in that direction. Well, there are two of them. First of all, uh, the way I described it is a failure of imagination. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they cannot imagine a world without slavery. Yeah. But the second yeah. thing is a practical consideration. Yeah. Rome had had slave revolts in the past. And every time there was yeah. a slave revolt in Rome, yeah. a lot of people died and generally yeah. the ugly deaths. And had Paul called for freeing slaves... It would have been read by the Romans and quite possibly by Christians as a call for a slave revolt. Yeah, it, in this, the, and again, that's what I mean by the, the kind of the, the immobility of the, the kind of social order that he's up against. It, it, this isn't kind of post-1960s America where you get enough people on board to protest, they're going to change policy. That, that wasn't going to happen in that world. So the, the, the move to emphasizing freedom of the will in the way that the early theologians were doing it was actually setting the groundwork for something as radical of, as what will come much later in, in, in Christian-influenced kind of uh, societies. But anyway... So, so what you have going on with the, this notion of liberty of conscience um, I across the board in, in the church is basically saying that, you know, human beings as image bearers of God in Christ, when they're formed and fashioned the right way, have the capacity to make moral judgments um, that are not to be compelled, that, you know, when they're oriented towards the good and, and that they have their own place in, in kind of figuring out how that applies in their lives. Now, this, so the church was never consistent with how it allowed people to do that. That's why we have reformations and things like that. So what do you get with Luther, for example? You have the Reformation, and you have uh, Luther, you know, in, in his famous story, at least, you know, unless I'm compelled by Scripture, right, or, you know, or biblical reasoning, if you will, uh, I'm compelled, you know, by conscience, is bound to the word of God. But notice the orientation of, Lewis, uh, of not Lewis, uh, of, of Luther's conscience. It's bound to something, right? Bound to the word of God and bound to biblical reasoning is probably the best way of putting his understanding of, of reason in that context. And so, you know, what can be, you know, reasonably inferred from the clear teaching of scripture and, and scripture as a whole. And so, Luther is appealing to a source that was Christian. He's appealing to a, a, a source that was across the board in the tradition. He wasn't coming up with something new there. He was actually appealing to the actual groundwork of, of, of what should be forming and, and holding our conscience captive as Christians. Um, but what you have is, as this kind of settles out and starts to enter in, as Chris said a little while ago, into new terrain, and as the, the, the um, moral vision and the worldview is shifting, we've talked many times about all the things that went into that, you have the human being and his relation to reality change. And one of the things that is at the heart of that is that the human being starts to take center stage. And human conscience then is, is, becomes almost an end in itself, Rather than it being, you know, even when we talk about it's bound to certain moral sources, it's bound to those moral sources insofar as those moral sources are read through what we find to be from the best of our ability or as a confirmation of our whatever um, binding. It is not that, that there is a, a, a kind of authority that is molding us in the same way that classic Christianity held to Scripture. Yeah, there's a kind of, uh, well, there's a conviction that I think people are raised to, uh, to possess 
So in other words, there is a moral formation that's going on in our yeah. culture, but it's, it's, I guess, insidious character is that it, it is really good at, at not calling attention to itself. Yeah. It's sort of just the background. It's the, it's the atmosphere. So that's yeah. why you can have absurd statements like, yeah. um, well, I'm not going to raise my child to believe anything. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to let that child uh, kind of choose what he or she wants to believe all along the way. Well, what, what's obscured in a statement like that is the conviction that a person can be autonomous in this way, in a, in a radically yeah. sort of fundamental way. In other words, that is what you believe. Yeah. So you are already inculcating that belief in your child, whether you are honest about it or not, or calling attention to it or not. And that is out of step with, well, about 99.999% of, of the human race for all of human history. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, that, that, that's right. And what we get down to, I mean, formation. This is where I'm going to go with this, and 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 so that's kind of a, a lead into it. But but let me back up back to that Baptist point and kind of fill it out a little bit. So so one of the wars, the civil wars that was going on at the time between the conservative resurgence and the liberal who had pretty much control of the denomination, the kind of progressives, was was really um, a big fight over the notion of the authority of Scripture versus liberty of conscience. And this already um, reveals that there is a, a problem with the worldview that is shaping the battle. It's that there is a division there. Um, so what you have is this, this, this goes across the board eventually. I mean, in Catholicism, you will have the same thing happen after the 1950s where conscience starts to be played over against the authority of, you know, the magisterium. Um, in the Protestant world, it's, it's conscience, liberty of conscience played over against the authority of Scripture. Um, or it's the authority of Scripture reread so that liberty of conscience kind of, kind of has, it, has its sway. Um, but one of the things you saw appealed to by the liberal and left-leaning Baptists was basically liberty of conscience, that we are allowed by our faith and compelled by our faith. You know, they see themselves as, as submitting to an authority, the, the doctrinal teaching of liberty of conscience, to interpret the, the scriptures in light of what we believe is the most truthful interpretation of them, and therefore apply that in our lives and make judgments about it without being compelled and forced to believe the way kind of the fundamentalists do, if you will. And, and so this is, this is their kind of, this is where you see a worldview shift starting to impact kind of Baptist culture there, a Southern Baptist culture. It happens across the board in denominations. Um, but what you had is, so in the reser conservative resurgence was to go say, wait a minute, no. Liberty of conscience cannot supersede the authority of Scripture. So basically, external authority over against kind of internal conscience or, you know, some kind of balancing act that, that allows for those things kind of to be redefined. And I think both of them already speak of a problem. And I think, Glenn, you, hit it, uh, uh, you hinted at it. The way the early church talked about it was it was not external authority versus internal authority, if you will. The internal and external in the classic Christian vision are related in a whole fundamentally different way. That the commands of God are not arbitrary edicts that go against the best of our nature. They actually, uh, they actually draw out what our created natures are oriented towards prior to our fall in this. And so there isn't an internal versus external. Um, but what this ends up doing is basically following the same thing culture does, is making individual conscience um, almost equatable with individual consciousness, right? I think, therefore, I am is equated with my conscience. Who I am, as I understand myself to be consciously, is basically also what I hold as my most fundamental conscience. So in the West when therapeutic culture takes over and psychological man comes to the center, my consciousness of myself on this journey of self-discovery of my identity, what I believe, who I am, what affirms me, what makes sense of me, is, is really my consciousness of myself 
And that becomes identical to my core convictions about myself and reality. And that becomes equated with conscience. And that becomes the authority in my life. And that's why I just had an episode happen, um, a church I went to several years back locally. This is the third time I've seen it where someone online, you know, friends from that church has posted that they have now come out as both gay and committed to Christ. And, but a little further down the, 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 you know, the public post is that um, don't send me messages of sermons or theology or this, you know, I believe me, I've been through them. I just want to be here and affirming of, of people that are going through this issue themselves. Um, and one of the things that first struck me by the whole thing is that here is that classic divide between conscience as basically an affirmation of my own consciousness of who I think I am, um, basically being the end game to cut off all conversation about the other part of conscience, which is the application of moral principles the right way. Um, that's what the classic view held, that the reason we appeal to conscience is that we can be formed in such a way through scripture, tradition, moral reasoning, reason, that we can exercise ourselves the, the capacity to discern right and wrong, and then that judgment can be something that we can trust ourselves to until further light comes. And so what yeah. you saw here was basically cutting off the capacity for any external truth to challenge what has now become a conviction for a person. Yeah, we've, I, you know, I, I'm sure Glenn can identify a number of people in his circles that have done the same thing you just described, and I certainly can do that. And I guess uh, one of the things that I see happening with regard to this phenomenon is it's taking us uh, in one of two directions. One is this, there's a fracturing of the church. We see that all around us. Um, but the other side of it is, uh, and this is the healthy side of it, it's forcing people to think more deeply about how we got here. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons why I think our show is, has been helpful to many people yeah. because uh, we're not the only people who have, who have observed this. And there, and there are a lot of folks saying, well, why is it that everything I say to these people just falls on deaf ears? How could that be possible when we've known each other for 10, 15, 20 years and we had... Uh, a common faith, or at least we thought we did, and now all mm. of a sudden this new yeah. fad is just sweeping, uh, you know, through society, and these people are just being swept up by it. What? How? How do we understand that, or how can we explain that? And so I think that the long game is actually very encouraging because yeah. I, I think that God is handing us over to some things yeah. uh, in the church to discipline us, uh, but that process could be, you know hundreds of years in the, in, you know, in terms of how it plays out. Um, I don't have any, uh, sort of, I don't have any hope. That's probably the wrong way to put it, but you get my drift. I think that I'm going to see the end of it. Yeah. Now, if yeah. God wants to bring the end of it, do something <laughs> uh, great. I'm all for it. <laughs> but in terms of my own sense of how these things tend to play out, yeah, I think it's going to take a while. It's it's interesting because I think I think you're exactly right, and I, I think this is it's kind of a it's a long game. I, I've accepted that most of what we're, we're even up to is for for is out of our love for the future of the church and our children, um, and 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 the like. Um, it's not something necessarily you see, but a, as I said, a lot of people are just for the first time digesting the significance of what Lewis and Tolkien and other figures yeah. like that were up to. Right, um, and in their moment, they had probably, well, they had no idea of how profound their witness was. I was reading again uh, Lewis's Pilgrim's Regress, and and even as simple as kind of his, his you know, kind of obvious caricatures are, th this stuff is still just speaks volumes and echoes loud um, at, at, this, at this moment. Yeah, I mean, he, he saw things uh, and did implications of things, uh, and... Um, I mean, like you said, we're just kind of finally catching up, broadly speaking. I think there were people at, in his day who's, who agreed, who, who yeah. were, you know, kind of on the cutting edge of thought. 
who understood uh, where things were trending. But uh, yeah, your typical church member, even up until 10 years ago, could not have uh, believed the stuff that we see in the newspaper every day today. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. Yeah. Well, there, there's another dimension to this that's also worth noting, and that's that freedom of conscience only goes in one direction. Yeah. You know, right. you have to <laughs> affirm you. I mean, I have identified myself as whatever it is I've identified myself as. And you have to affirm that. Yeah. Whether or not, well, you don't have the right not to agree with my self-identification. Yeah, it's the sac- sacredness of that notion of conscience. Um, that, that and, you know, again, it, it, it comes out of a good theological legacy, but when it's ripped and put into a, a different frame, it becomes the, the sacred object itself, which is, ironically, the sacred subject. <laughs> and and, and, and it, I think, you know, and I'll back up to the person I was mentioning. I mean, here's a person who grew up in the faith, grew up loving the scriptures, grew up committed to the church, This and married at one time, had a something happened that wasn't their fault, and yet has come this far. And then you have to, th- again, this is somebody who's obviously wrestled with this. And, and I think this is one of the things I think people need a lot of clarity on. It's not easy just to give them a, a simple book to read. It, it's that, I mean, especially let's, let's focus on kind of the Baptist free church world for a minute because they exemplify a lot of the evangelical conception of things. Um, th- this notion that scripture is a final authority for faith and life, they are, tend to be regulative principle, a much stronger, you know, c- kind of emphasis on, you know, needing a text to kind of underwrite a practice. Um, but what happens is liberty of conscience starts to easily feed into, well, wait a minute. Liberty of conscience means I need to be faithful to scripture, and that means that I have the capacity, just like anyone else, to be able to discern the truth of the Bible and the Spirit's active in my life, just like it's active in everyone else's. So what happens if the Spirit and and my conscience start to say, wait a minute, the church has been wrong. And when the culture starts to raise moral questions and said, look, church defended slavery, the church did all these things, um, um, it was wrong, what, you know, what happens if it's wrong now? And haven't we evolved to a kind of social state in which we we're not dealing with pagan, for example, sexual practices, but committed unions? And so what if we're dealing with a whole different situation Scripture didn't address? So this is where, where people start going when they yeah. start exploring. Well, they, the, those, those particular things uh, are never really picked up on. For example, yeah. this idea of the committed union. If we were yeah. to look at the, da- the data— Mm-hmm. Uh, it's almost non-existent, particularly amongst homosexual men. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you could say something different about lesbians. Yeah. But uh, and I think you can. But it, but they they tend to be very unactive sexually <laughs> yeah. from all the studies I've I've yeah. I've observed I've, yeah. I've had a chance to, to look yeah. at. But but how is it that this came about? Well, one of, one of the more significant reads in my life um, really was a kind of a turning point for me was when I read Harold Bloom's The American Religion. Yeah. And, you know, in that he's, his, his, Kate, his, his thesis is that the American religion is Gnosticism, but he yeah. takes us, he takes a special interest in the Southern Baptists. Yeah. And, and he, <laughs> yeah. he's, he identifies a, a doctrine uh, that's referred, he refers to, or he's, 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 it's not something he, he created. He's, he did his research, but, uh, it was referred to as soul competency, this idea that the individual soul is competent yes. to discern uh, truth without uh, reference to uh, the church, to confessions, to creeds, to, you know, basically, you, you know, kind of a Gnostic <laughs> conception. Right. And, and, and non-incarnational, non-mediator, or, well, to be, let's just use Baptist language, they would see the incarnation as the only medium. <laughs> the only medium. In other words, there, there, isn't any, there, isn't any, there isn't any analogous relation between the sacraments to the incarnation. It's just incarnation. And they have kind of this direct soul-competent relation there. And so 
and so what what ends up happening yeah you're you're exactly right this is what you experience in a lot of that i grew up in a lot of that environment is this notion that you are a little magisterium unto yourself now you have to be able to argue well you know back in the day um but you know you don't even need to do that now you just need to say i'm i'm convicted that scripture teaches this you're convicted it teaches yeah. that so you know let's go well, our own way the l- language of i have a burden you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, her, Right. Yeah, that actually, in a lot of ways, sounds like Mormonism, um, yeah, yeah. at least so on the true. individual level. Um, but the difference between the Mormon and the Southern Baptist on this level, uh, on this, is the the fact that the Mormons do, in fact, have a kind of magisterium. Yeah, and Baptists are radically congregational. Yeah. So that each, you know, the there there's an analogy between the individual's conscience to determine what scripture means and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and the individual congregation's yeah. conscience yeah. to determine what it means to to be Baptist within certain parameters. Yeah, now, getting getting back to to the American religion, there is a whole section on the Mormons. Just so you know. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but he identified, and I'm, so just so we offend everybody, he identified <laughs> John Wesley as the father of American Gnosticism. <laughs> well, as, as my, my 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 pastor here would agree, <laughs> he, he's not a not a fan. <laughs> Yeah, ever since they kicked him out of Oxford for good reason. <laughs> the um, but but I, I mean I think I mean again the the movement in the Baptist life was a recognition even when I was still Baptist a, a long time ago in a land far away. Um, they understood the necessity for retrieval of their own confessions, and so you have confessional Baptist. I mean a lot of the reform. It has a reformed wing that is, you know, very a lot of fans of our show, and and that commitment was there. The Baptist kind of moved to say that a proper view of liberty of conscience and soul competence has to be one governed by its participation in in the truth writ large. Um, yeah, by, it is the, not. Yeah. yeah, yeah. By the way, getting back to the American religion. Um, with regard to the conservative resurgence within the SBC, Harold Bloom was very uh, appalled. So he, he was a self-identified. Well, just so you know, he's a secular Jew yep. who identifies as a Gnostic. So he was actually an enthusiast for the moderate party within the Southern Baptist Convention. And I knew some of those guys. I remember when when uh, a guy that I had a had a kind of a casual friendship with in Boston was uh, essentially defrocked. Uh, he had been a uh, a bureaucrat within the Southern Baptist Convention and was was on the outside because he had been part of that modern yeah. progressive wing. And and I don't want to rag on the on the Southern Baptist, but I mean e- even with the con- conservative uh, resurgence, which I was kind of in, a, a student of in the days. The passionate defenders of kind of Baptist orthodoxy, sadly, were tended to be strongly charismatic figures, great gunslingers, not so likable as human beings. <laughs> but they did. But they did not. They did not do what they needed to do next. Is really trace the theological underpinnings and the and the in the, uh, the the Christian vision that need to sustain inerrancy. And because of that, this is where you end up. The Bible that you have basically a biblical text that transcends all natural reality, or it can be relativized by historical, critical, grammatical methods, even in the in the the kind of Protestant world, evangelical world. And so that's that's another thing. I mean, we could we could go on and on about the way in which certain understandings of the historical grammatical approach to scripture um, do a healthy job of basically um, relativizing almost any doctrinal dog- dogma that you can come up with because it isn't governed by any kind of uh, metaphysical convictions grounded in scripture. It has a kind of naturalistic approach in its, in its methodologies. And so, I mean, this is why when you read a book like uh, Lewis Ayer's brilliant book on, on, uh, the, uh, con- something on Nicaea, I can't remember the full title, 
but where he talks about the way in which looking at patristic exegesis that came up with our solidified doctrines of Trinity and incarnation, which are purely biblical and make sense of the full biblical differentia, if you will, that, that when you look at that, those practices are fundamentally at odds with the naturalistic historic grammatical that has developed and claims to be the Protestant evangelical approach to the text. Now, the good well, news is Protestant evangelicals have not stayed there, and we actually have an encouraging generation of young, young theologians that, that are starting to, to really draw off of a, a much richer um, non-Gnostic line. Yeah, my, uh, my first uh, uh, teacher when it came to exegesis uh, forbade us from looking for typological, uh, you know, sort of uh, things in the Old Testament, you know, to, to forbade us from looking at types. And when you'd bring up, you know, Paul did that, you know, he didn't really have a good response. But now he's a Unitarian and... Uh, <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> yeah, I had a connection with him a couple of years back. But uh, anyway, so, um, yeah, that's that's way, that's the way I was initially educated. Um, yeah. Remember, uh, what was it, Gordon Fee's book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth? Yep. Yep. That, that was definitely uh, what we're talking about here. And that was yeah, and that Stewart. was more. Yeah, P. and Stewart. Yeah. yeah at, at one point, if I remember right, they actually say that just because Paul did it doesn't mean you can. He was an <laughs> apostle. You're not. Yeah. You yeah. know, basically that that kind of thing. So the, the question that immediately comes up is, OK, so we're not supposed to learn how to read the Bible from the Bible. Well, well, exactly. or, or even just like. Okay, how about Augustine? <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's right. Yeah, they did it. Yeah, they thought he was that old Platonizer. Right. The um, <laughs> but 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 with Paul, yeah, Paul sadly gets the brunt of everyone's you know well, punishment. But but the thing is, Glenn, <laughs> Glenn, about that is, I mean, here's Paul. Follow me as I follow Christ Jesus, right? So and. If, and look at Jesus on the road to Emmaus, who saw himself yeah. all over the Old Testament. That's right. That's Matter right. In fact, he even said that that the scriptures, all the scriptures, speak of him. That's it. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I remember a, a, a professor from Cambridge when he was retiring did a seminar at Duke, Nicholas Lash, Catholic uh, theologian. But one of one of his book titles, which was just brilliant, is "Theology on the Road to Emmaus." Uh, it just, I mean, it completely captured that point is that when we start to look at things from the light of the world, the Christological center, I mean, this is what I think the, some of the best theology being done today is stuff that has that retrieval of incarnation um, and its significance for a Trinitarian theology and a Christian metaphysics. I mean, that stuff is, that is what gives me a lot of hope today, that the generations ahead of us are actually in a lot of good hands, despite all of these bad trends from a lot of other dimensions. It's an encouraging thing. I mean, think about when we were trained. Um, even you know, I kind of came at a, a little later date, but there was we were still dealing with positivism. We were still oh, yeah. dealing with rigorous naturalism and atheism in a kind of a certain kind of crass form. We were dealing with with kind of we were dealing with things. Um, a lot of hangover enlightenment things. And then when post-modernity hit, which we were trained for, engaging, um, but one of the things that we weren't sure of is whether or not an orthodoxy and a retrieval would survive that. And that hard work from a lot of our professors and kind of what we've been committed to has really paid off. When I look at the stuff being published by people that are really digging into the riches of, of reform tradition and it's doctrinal and ethical orthodoxy. Even if it's not being heard in the churches yet, it's encouraging. You're seeing real orthodoxy that is alive and breathing and shaping the next generation of pastors. Yeah, uh, Tom, I, I just should note that when I was in college, the the thing was existentialism. Yeah, I remember oh, existentialism. I go right. back that yeah, far. Yeah. Well, but I think that— Today, that what today you, the only existentialist that's left is Woody Allen. <laughs> it, but, Glenn, you could probably argue that the kind of existential humanism that was, was trending there is really a lot of what shapes this view of conscience that is the, this view of liberty of conscience, that basically the pursuit— Kind of, the, kind of the self-pursuit, you know, existence over essence, right? The ability for me somehow to to find out who I am through the choices I make and the desires that I have that are un, unformed, as, as Chris was saying, 
that, that is an existential yeah. dimension to this that is that is fundamentally replaced Christian metaphysics. Yeah, and and the the emphasis on authenticity and those kinds of things. Yeah. And often, um, the authentic. I, I've actually so. argued that existentialism is nihilism light. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. You, you get to be your own Ubermensch. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing yeah. about that too that it should be encouraging to us is that I mean, it was it was so prevalent uh, as you remember, Glenn. It was just you couldn't have a conversation without getting into existentialism with anybody about anything in the yeah. '60s, '70s, and '80s. And now it's like dead. I mean, I mean, who who even talks about stuff like that anymore? Yeah. I mean, we, we're talking about the legacy of it, but I mean, in terms yeah. of you know, people aren't talking about Sartre. People aren't talking about that's right. That, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't they don't see the nausea that is going right. to be the result of of actually what Sartre and Camus and the other figures knew and Dostoevsky. I mean, they they knew what is the outcome of this they they weren't they weren't sitting around saying this is a good thing they they saw a nihilistic uh, nausea as the kind of result of this stuff and, and this is the thing it's it's that when conscience and consciousness become identical and i think i'm talking about the modern self and 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 it's it's self-defining you know emphasis um it, you're locked in a subjectivity at the end of the day, or a social confirmation at the end of the day, none of which liberate. And of course, you feel like it liberates because what has happened is the Enlightenment basically want, saw itself as taking the Christian understanding of liberation, secularizing it, and making it now such that through your own kind of moral conscience acting on its own accord can liberate you from Christianity, from moral texts that go against what you affirm about yourself, really basically provides a buffer so that you can be locked into, you know, your your core desires, wants, you know, conformities. And it doesn't really offer you liberation, but it feels like it because you're being liberated by something that puts a question mark over all those things about your fallen self that you're supposed to be putting off or getting rid of. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that's worth remembering, is, and I know I talked about this before, is that the entire concept of liberty, uh, as classically understood, is the ability to make choices within the boundaries set by natural and divine law. Yeah. And yet what you do when you become a, well, a materialist or a secularist or something like that, or frankly, when you you give in to um, uh, expressive individualism, is you eliminate divine and natural law. You just write that off. Yeah. And as soon as you do this, you're no longer in the zone of liberty. Yeah. Um, and as a result, you cannot really be liberated. Yeah. Because there is no liberty left. Liberty is destroyed as soon as you go to moral relativism or something like that. And that's why you end up with, well, what is classically called license, which is uh, the ability to make choices without restriction. Yeah. And that's really the world we're in now. We no longer have liberty. Well, one of the things that I recall from the existentialist sort of writers back in the day is uh, the, the, almost the masculine character of existentialism at that time. What we have today is so effete, so soft, so sentimental, it, it really is hard to imagine that it came out of what was kind of the early work of the existentialist. Remember the emphasis on the courage and, and, and the sort of the courage to create your meaning, mm -hmm. uh, the courage to be, remember that uh, book yeah, by yeah, Tillich? Yeah. Um, Tillich, yeah, the courage yeah, to so, be. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, it had a masculine character. Yeah. Uh, you think about a person like Jack London, or somebody like um, Hemingway, they were they were working uh, with existentialist assumptions about you know yeah. reality with their fiction, yeah. and their yeah. fiction had a this bravado, this this very strong virile character um, that just doesn't exist anymore. I mean, we, yeah. we live in a in a world of uh, just you know. Everything is lined with with bubble wrap and soft yeah. pillows, and no one's ever supposed to have their feelings hurt. Uh, that was not the world I remember in the '60s and '70s with these guys. These guys were all about 
uh, taking it on the chin for your beliefs and just going out and creating meaning for yourself. So you're right, Glenn, I'm not, you know, uh, denying your points at all, but, but it's, it's remarkable how, how just kind of the tone of it is so different now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that I think, yeah, that, you know, we can give, you know, a lot of hands to feminism because of, for that. Um, I mean, I, I was, I was, you know, theologically the other, you know, I was reading an article, uh, actually, uh, kind of evaluating the theological substructure of, of, uh, Pope Francis's environmental lecture on Laudus C or whatever. Um, but one of the things to his credit is he affirms right at the forefront, which really reframes the thing, um, is the, the creedal, and biblical emphasis on God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, the, pa- the proper patriarchal orientation of the whole created reality, even the sonship of Christ is oriented to the Father. And what you get there, the lovingness and the balance of power, all powerfulness in the right combination that Christianity gives us, um, are, 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 are kind of the very things that I think get lost as we move away from a proper Trinitarian and creational understanding of things as the Bible sets it forth and the creeds reemphasize it. And so what ends up happening is the frame in which you are, the conscience per se, um, it starts to have to fill a void, you know, either to protect itself from a kind of bad father, God, um, or a bad authority that wants to undermine me rather than the way Christians understand creation and redemption, is that what we have is the internal orientation of ourselves as creatures of God that receive as gift what we are and who we are and are oriented towards basically we're made hungry and the only food for our life that actually sustains us ultimately is the bread of heaven, right? And so because of that, there is a thrust towards, an orientation towards truth and reality in our very nature that our fallen nature wants to war against. And what you have in this new sense of conscience is a affirmation of our war against that father that is good, that manna alone which will fulfill us, and it is the continuous looking for some kind of bread of life amongst the things that will gratify the temporal, the limited, the fallen, will satiate our fallenness. And I, re- I think that's really where we end up. We end up with thinking that the highest thing we can get in our fallenness is the equivalent of heaven, right? The, the best we can get is kind of an affirmation of my desires by, you know, by God that allows me to act on my most, you know, base instincts and affirm myself in my fallenness is somehow the equivalent of the happiness of heaven. Um, and I think, you know, apart from the breakthrough of beauty, truth, and goodness ultimately grounded in Christ, these people don't have a chance. And so, you know, the flip side is what, what do we do? This is a long story. We, our show is about a lot of this. But it's about fashioning our lives towards the good and the way Scripture sets it out so that we refract that beauty and joy in heaven, that, ma- that manna from heaven, that allows people to finally see the, the qualitative and quantitative difference that the riches of heaven have compared to the cheap substitute that we want to run to and think is our liberation. I mean, that's where we end up, right? You know, it's the difference between art that elevates versus art that simply, you know, paints a picture of a dunghill, you know? <laughs> Which is literally what you get uh, in in, in most art uh, (laughs) galleries these days. Yeah. Yeah. I I guess, uh, what do you think, you know, we've we've pointed a little bit toward uh, some positive things that are developing Mm -hmm. in the world of theology uh, in, uh, you know, the the formation of pastors and so forth. At the local church level, though, I mean, it still seems like we're a long way away yeah. from seeing this kind of thing kind of filter down into just yeah. at least most churches. I mean, yeah. I think there are some there are some uh, worthwhile 
exceptions uh, that we can yeah. we can look at. But what, what do you think is the next kind of phase to this? How, how does how does this get hap- How does this get addressed at the local church level? Time? Yeah, I think this is re- really where the rubber meets the, the road. And and you know, one of the thing, a couple things I've been reflecting on here here's a source for people. And I I don't go along with all of the kind of solution of the problem, but here's one by uh, Do you know J. Daryl Charles? For the Acton Institute, he put together this book, uh, "The Unformed Conscience of Evangelicalism," um, a very good book uh, that addresses the way in which, you know, we have this issue of conscience, and yet it's unformed. The evangelicals have been out of the loop for for a long time, but yet we're starting to recognize the significance of formation, which other traditions have have you know been running with a long time. And and so he's not simply trying to catch up; he's trying to say. What does a distinctly gospel-centered approach to virtue cultivation look like in in the Christian life? That's a very good book. It's a starting place, um, and um, but I think I think there's a few ways in. But I want to address one issue, and, and he actually does it here. You know, Mark Knoll's work. He's he's done stuff where he's talked about kind of the the scandal of the evangelical mind. Um, I was talking to a pastor about six months ago uh, locally at the same church to which this other person is a a former member, and they were just doing the the easy version of Carl Truman's book versus the hard version in in a class. He finally, I was telling him for four years about, yeah, well, Glenn knows who this is. I was telling him for like four or five years what's coming down the pike, and I don't think they had an antenna for it. Eventually, it's landed in their church's lap, and they're trying to read this book, but they found it so hard to read that it, it was just was they want the answers, but they're screaming because the, the, they have we have been so removed from from having to challenge our congregants to have to read hard stuff and think hard about some issues that they were they're they're. 10 steps behind. Now, not all churches are in that circumstance, but guess what? A lot of them are. A lot of pastors are. And this is not the first time in history. We all know there were times where pastors could barely read and they had to read sermons written for them, okay? So it's just not a new thing. I think one level is we need to become literate, not only biblically. We need to return to the scriptures rigorously, that's for sure. We need to understand church history a bit more, but we need to become able to start reading things, even if you start with something like a journal of first things or touchstone or, you know, fight, laugh, feast, or one of these things that allows you to start thinking about how you take scripture and apply it to hard case issues. Um, I think someone like reading C.S. Lewis is still a very good way of taking, seeing these profound things and seeing how they affect us here. Um, I think with children, reading imaginative literature shaped, you know, like Chris's book, and I guess his soon to be next book. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not getting into that. But, um, but uh, don't worry, Lynn isn't here right now. <laughs> okay, I don't want I don't want anyone in trouble. Um, th- that is one thing. But I, I think you're right, Chris. I mean, I think maybe the pastor can be the leader here. Um, and the educated kind of clergy and and elders and, and the like, or, or you know how your church is structured, because yeah, it can think, start the emphasis yeah. of a formation more seriously, not simply just Bible stories and catechism, but penetrating into the way the ideas of culture are influencing ourselves and children and being able to wean ourselves off of it and, and offer a Christian alternative. It's, it's conversion work, so it's hard. But I, I think there's one caveat that I'd add, and that is unless you are thoroughly disenchanted with the world or disillusioned with the world, yeah. that broader education yeah. uh, may not... Uh, lead to all of the outcomes we'd like to see. So I've known guys who get infatuated with some stuff and I, and then end up going down some trails that, you know, they, that they really can't see the sort of the, the cesspool that will be where they end up at the end of the, of the journey. I can just yeah. think of just guys off the top of my head that I, that are now apostate. Um, hmm. 
so it, 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 you know, there's part of me that says, yes, we need to, to get, a, 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 you know, acquainted with a lot of these different things. For example, when, the, when, when we were talking about existentialism a while yeah. ago, I bet uh, a very small minority of the pastors who listened to us had a real sense of what we were talking about. Yeah. Um, now that doesn't mean that you should go out and read Sartre tomorrow. Uh, yeah, or yeah, Camus. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> you're, right. you're going to be up against uh, an adversary yeah. intellectually that you're not equipped to take. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, maybe maybe a flip side, and I think the, the, I think I, I think you hit you both. I mean, I think this is kind of a pressing point of our time, and I'm going to have to admit it kind of boldly. We don't yet have enough good sources that tie the better theological and ethical work being done to the congregation. We don't. We don't have that middle. And, and what Lewis was trying to do with imaginative literature and Tolkien, we're trying to do that very thing. They were trying to take these riches and bring them into a story, a narrative form into, into the imaginative life of people. And I think there is, there's a lesson right there. Um, I, I think it, it is, it's very hard Chris, because I'll give you an example. Metaphysical thinking is not easy, but you know what? If we don't get a hold of the metaphysical assumptions that our culture has and that have impacted us versus the metaphysical assumptions of the Bible and Christianity, we risk reading the Bible and practicing our faith far more from the assumptions oh, that yeah. aren't Christian. And these aren't easy to pluck out. I mean, people like Paul Tyson, I think, are doing great work on retrieving God as first truth and then unpacking the metaphysical. Because, But most people can't get a hold of that. So I think the challenge to the church is to create people that can digest it, to imaginatively communicate it, to their congregations to give them that rich biblical picture that has historically been ours by our by the faith. Yeah, on the, I, I, on, yeah. yeah I came across something just uh, the other day that illustrates your point very well, yeah. Tom. There was a, an endorsement for the Passion Bible, and it just oh. it was just so absurd. I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> but there's this woman who said, and her, her statement was, "I love to make the Bible come alive." <laughs> so. Uh, now, yeah. of course, what that misses is that the Bible makes us come alive. And yeah. what, what, yeah. what we need to get in touch with is yeah. not uh, the window dressing that makes it appealing to the That's right. to, to the to the taste buds of people whose tastes have been uh, kind of fostered by a, a, a sick world. Yeah, we need to to help people acquire better taste. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah. it's the, it's the, it's the scripture, uh, that enlivens us. But the very way that she put it, let me know that she really looks at the world as kind of having authority yeah. at a level that the yeah. scriptures have to conform to yeah. rather than the other way around. Yeah. That, go ahead. Yeah. Another dimension of this, Tom, and this is one thing that C.S. Lewis did, I think, extraordinarily well, is we need popularizers. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean imaginative literature. Yeah. But we need people who can take the, the work that these um, theologians are doing and translate it from academies into English. Yeah. You know, for the yeah. normal person. Yeah. Uh, being a popularizer is sort of a, a negative to most academics. Right. Yeah. But I think it's one of the most important things you can do, yeah. which is one of the reasons why I strive to make my books as readable as possible. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, I mean, look, I'll, I'll tell you this. Why is it, you know, I, again, I'm dating myself, but why is it that the music of the 60s sticks in so many people's heads um, even as children who grew up listening to it at a car, which I did, because it popularized and it took something. Those songs sit in my head. I can hear, my, my son can hear them now. And he didn't even grow up in that environment. And he knows who the artist is, what the song's about, and the lyrics. Why? Because they were able to communicate whatever they were trying to communicate. They were able to tap in. Now, I'll give you an example. What does most folk music from most cultures do? It takes profound things and brings it into poetic and experiential form 
that ties it to everything that we know about reality and tries to help make it intelligible. And this, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think, I think that's what the imaginative dimension, uh, what I was talking about, was getting into. Is, uh, I mean, Charles Taylor talks about the social imaginary, right? So, okay. We're uh, way I'll over time, you. Tom. Yeah, <laughs> way, we're way over time. Taylor probably have to do some clipping. Um, but anyway, my last point is Charles Taylor talks about the social imaginary, the way in which background beliefs are so governing our assumptions and practices, we're not even aware of it. Um, we are working off of the wrong background beliefs, and we're not even conscious of them. And I, I think you're right. We have to tap into all the creaturely media that God has given us to be able to communicate his glory. And I think that's, that's the way forward. Okay, let's wrap it up with that. All right, <laughs> thanks a lot for listening to the Theology Podcast. We appreciate uh, the fact that you got all the way to this point in the show. You're at the end. And uh, if you would, go to iTunes or Spotify and give us a great rating. And if you are really inspired, uh, go to Patreon and become a patron. Anyway, enough for today. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The Theology Podcast is a ministry of Trinity Reformed Church in Huntsville, Alabama. If you like this podcast, you might enjoy another of our podcasts, The Good Life Podcast, featuring Matt Carpenter interviewing experts in their field about how their work contributes to the good life.